3 ohms to honor all the gurus even if you don't have a guru or a teacher a mentor I think most everyone has a mentor or a teacher we may not consider them gurus and they had mentors themselves and those mentors had mentors and so with these uh, with this mantra we honor all the gurus all the mentors all the teachers who are responsible for helping to mold us and shape us and make us who we are intellectually behaviorally as people guru brahma guru vishnu Asmai Shri Gurave Namaha Asmai Shri Gurave Namaha Asmai Shri Gurave Namaha Famous palmist, Western palmist named Cairo. C-H-E-I-R-O, very famous, I uh, think British, he was a lord, somebody. He went to India and he studied with, uh, you know, a guru there and he learned palmistry like inside and out. And he practiced for many years, very successful, and then all of a sudden he quit. And people asked him, he wouldn't tell anyone, but they asked his wife and she said he lost the yantra that his teacher had given him so he couldn't predict anymore. Like there was something special about this magical yantra that helped him to make predictions accurately. So I thought that was an interesting story. So this is your yantra, and this will help you predict and predict, tell, the, uh, tell your future, tell your past, as well as help you to get an idea of what your present's like. Okay. Um, before we get started, I want to read you a quick quote. The paradox of our age. We have bigger houses, but smaller families. More conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, but more problems. More medicines, but less healthiness. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet the new neighbor. We build more computers to hold more information to produce more copies than ever, but have less communication. We have become long on quantity, but short on quality. There are times, these are times of fast foods, but slow digestion. Tall man, but short character. Steep profits, but shallow relationships. It's a time when there is much in the window, but nothing in the room. So I thought that pretty poignant, and the fact that everyone is here trying to go deep. This is what we're all trying to do here. And Ayurveda, Jyotisha, decoding your life, palmistry. This is also a yantra. This. This is a square. Your chart is a square. Okay. A good reader of this type of yantra can tell you your whole horoscope, your ascendant, that your moon is here, your sun is there, without knowing your birth time, without having a computer. Because they are they not short on information. They you're able to go very deep. And these sciences allow you to do that. Okay. Okay. In that square, we're going to draw an X. Okay. So far, so good. Should I slow down? Now, inside the square, we're going to draw another square perpendicular to the first. Uh-oh. 
or a diamond. Okay? This is our young. Now, I want you to draw Roman numerals in each of these compartments in the order that I'm drawing them here. Can everybody see? How's my handwriting? So far, so good. W with lines, I'm OK. <laughs> Once I start actually writing words, then <laughs> it's a challenge. OK? This never changes. This is the fixed view of the horoscope. Means, number one, Roman number one, is always the first house. This is always the first house. So, house, go, just point to that, okay? Now, first question, three, you know, everyone is going to, but I have a different number in here. <laughs> Those Arabic numerals, so-called Arabic numerals, are actually Vedic numerals that, anyway, uh, meaning one, two, three, four, like this. Those will change. Those indicate the signs. Right now, we're not interested. Forget about those numbers. All we care about is that this big diamond is the first house. In fact, you can draw a little accentuation and shade around it because this is the most important part of your yantra. Okay? It's most important because it gives you the most information about you. And really that's why we're here today. So this first house tells us about the self. Okay? So write self. So what is the self? the body, your name, your birth, your general health and status. Really, basically, this is you. Okay? So body, name, health. Um, and by name, I mean your physical name, but also your, st your stature in society. If you have a strong first house, you can punch through any obstacles. You have a weak first house, even if you're born into royalty, you kind of eh, squander it. Okay? First house. Self, the body, your image. This is your image. Actors often have an accentuated first house. Politicians, athletes, at least those athletes who get the Nike commercials because they have big image, big um, sense of self, okay? First house. So second house, we mentioned that this is your birth also. Right after you're born, you are nourished. Second house is sustenance, okay? We're going to go through all the 12 houses and give you a few key words so you have them. Okay, then you can always refer to this. So sustenance means what? When you're a baby or a child, it means food. When you're an adult, it means money. Because money buys you food and shelter. Okay? It's also a house of immediate family. This family is also your support. Okay? Third house. Third house is an interesting house. It's, a power, it's the house of self-effort. Courage. The, the idea of 
I can do whatever I want to do. I can do what I, what I put my mind to. People who have strong placements in the third house, when I used to do readings, I would see their chart, and I'd see that powerful third house, and maybe look at their hand and say, you don't believe in this stuff. You believe. Why, why are you getting a reading from me? They're like, yeah, my girlfriend made me do it. You're right, I really don't. Like, yeah, you can do whatever the hell you want with your life. Because you believe in you, third house, and also um, people that don't have a, a strong fate line or no fate line. They believe they make their own, their own way in the world, and they do. But the irony is you can see that in the chart. So how does that work? Chart, they don't believe in the chart, but you can see the fact that they don't believe in the chart. Okay, fourth house home, mother, in the deep mind. The third house, you can say, is the superficial mind, so the, the, um, the active mind. The active mind creates, it looks at things, it creates associations, um, so the classical arts, so we get dance, art, um, acting, all happen from the third house. It's the house of the mind creating associations and links um, and interacting with the world. The fourth house is the deep subconscious mind, the one that you access in sleep or in very deep psychoanalysis, this type of thing. People with planets or emphasis here in the fourth house like to go deep into the subconscious cause of things, the, the underlying reason why a thing it, it is. Okay? So, deep mind. The fifth house is a very busy house. It's a house of children. When your client or someone comes and says, tell me about my children, you will look at their fifth house. Okay? This is the house of fun. Fun or recreation. Play. An extension of that is amorous play. So, romance, flirtation, fifth house. So, what do people do when they're romancing? They write poetry. It's also another house of creativity. Poetry, especially, fifth house. Um, fifth house people tend to be ministers or counselors. Classically, the fifth house is associated with buddhi. Buddhi is the capacity to discern X from Y, the ability to discriminate. It's, uh, in, it's higher intellect. The third house, we can say, is that superficial active mind, lower intellect, like, um, oh, got to do my taxes, let me send an email, that mind. The fifth house is the higher mind in the sense of this is the right thing to do, this is not. And that's why these people become counselors. They teach others. Fifth house, okay? Sixth house, service slash work and enemies. Duty or routine, okay? Sixth house, if the fifth house is maybe the sexiest house of the horoscope, the sixth house is the unsexiest house. <laughs> but the truth is, is you guys know who's studying Ayurveda, um, alternative um, medicine. If you want to go on a date, or if you want to go out and enjoy life, you have to brush your teeth. You have to take a shower. You have to clean your colon. You have to take care of the, what needs to be taken care of so that then you can enjoy. So this is, people who have strong placements in this house don't get a lot of recognition. But they are actually the ones who do the dirty work, the hard work. Nurses, 
uh, some often doctors, um, sanitation workers, uh, engineers behind the scenes, people who do the important stuff, but they don't get re recognized for it. Service. Uh, it is a house of enemies also, and we'll get into how that, so maybe lawyers, ambulance chasers, people like that, strong six house. Okay, seventh house is the house of the other. If this is self, this is other, directly opposite, okay? If the first house tells us about you as a person, the seventh house tells us about your relationship, how you relate with others, okay? So if you have all the malefics in here, all the bad planets, which we'll find out who those are, means your ability to relate with others is compromised. If all your malefics are here, it means your ability to experience good health, body, the, the pleasures of self, of existence in this world through a physical body are compromised. Okay, so other means relationships. Questions so far? No? So far so good? Eighth house is considered the most challenging house, and that's the politically correct term. It's the house of death and sex and taxes. All the stuff you cannot escape. in this world. Eighth house is the house of suffering, but it's also a house of moksha, as we'll see in a minute, in that it, gives a, it, it makes a person extremely deep. It, makes a, it can make a person very compassionate because they have suffered. They have experienced suffering and the weight of mortality. And so eighth house people can become philosophers. They can become grief counselors. They can become um, students and teachers of classical oral traditions. So um, orally transmitted traditions, such as Ayurveda, such as Oriental medicine, such as Jyotish. To be a good Jyotishi, you should have a decent eighth house. To be a good astrologer, just to tell you right now, eighth and fifth house should be somehow activated. It's somehow. Okay. There are many ways they can be activated, but these two houses, the, because you have to be a good counselor or minister, but you also have to have uh, your roots in deep tradition. Okay? Death, sex, and taxes. Ninth house is the best house of this horoscope. As bad as the eighth is, the ninth is that good. It's the house of the guru, of God, and uh, long distance travel, fortune. The ninth is the most auspicious house of the horoscope. It indicates very good karma. If we're speaking in Vedic terms, you came in with very positive karma, okay? If your ninth house is positively activated, okay? Tenth house, uh, profession, fame, and public, public standing. We're gonna talk about how to use Jyotish in your day-to-day -day life, like every day, by following the sun. So when the sun is directly overhead, it's in the 10th house. We're gonna talk about this in a, in a few minutes. And when something is directly overhead, you go, ah. So people with strong 10th house tend to become well-known, managers, CEOs, presidents, famous people, well-known people, respected people, 10th house. It's the highest house in the horoscope. Okay? Eleventh house, easy money. Friends. Society. And clubs. This is very similar to Western astrology. 
11th house, fun house, house of fun. People with strong placements in the 11th house, like Cindy Lauper, they just like that fun, <laughs> right? And 12th house, house of LOSS, loss. But this is a different type of loss than, say, the 8th house. The 8th house is like, man, you, you know, you're... What's that Alanis Morissette song that, um, like the theme comes to mind, I, I can't remember the lyrics. Like, you're, let's say you're on your way. Sing? sing? No. Okay, let's say you're on your way. Um, let's say you just won the lottery. And then the next day, you know, you got a terminal disease. What's the point? That's like an eighth house irony right there, loss. Like, it just hits you and you, you suffer through it. There's no, almost no redeeming comfort to it. Twelfth house type of loss is a loss with a commensurate gain. So twelfth house, for, for example, rules charity. You give, but you get something intangible in return. It rules um, working for dis disadvantaged causes for people who can't sort of help themselves. So like a foreign aid worker, uh, a person who helps people. Uh, well, it, this is also a house of foreign contacts, big house of foreign uh, contact. Um, someone who helps foreigners come into the country, someone who espouses foreign causes. Loss also, the 12th house is a house of bed pleasures. So people who sleep through the morning when the sun is in the 12th house, say between 8 to 10 a.m. Notice it's, if you get up before, right around sunrise or before then, like you're up and you're up. But if you wait till like 9, 10 to get up, it's so hard. Yes, it's kapha time. But also the sun is in the 12th house. And the 12th house is about bed pleasures. It's about, mmm, it feels so good just to lounge in the pillow. Also means sex, indulgence. And when you, you know, when you, as you Ayurvedic people and um, Oriental medicine people know, when you expend yourself in sex, you lose energy, you lose vitality. But you get something else in return. You get a certain pleasure. So Madonna has significant places, placements here, for one, from what I understand of her chart. Um, and a lot of people who are um, sometimes hedonists, addictions you can see here, alcoholism, um, because there's a sense of luxury and sensuality also so associated with this house. Ironically, loss is also moksha. It is the loss of your mundane consciousness, the loss of your body. Moksha means enlightenment. But literally, the root, uh, the root of the word moksha is much, which means release. Freedom from bondage. You're, you're loosening the, the bonds of this mortal coil. Moksha. So again, people with placements here. Again, if we bring up Shri Madana, strong sensuality, but also a deep interest in Kabbalah, a deep interest in, in, in mystical subjects, of, of freeing herself from herself, even to the sense of, I mean, I, I hate to harbor a Madonna, but, you know, even with every fashion change every year, she's freeing herself of an old identity. She's going into a new identity. So, spiritual seekers, people who seek to free themselves from old identities, okay? or who may have trouble finding their identity. People with 12th house placements, maybe not sure who they are. Okay? Is it okay if I bring up like famous people? Is that okay? George Clooney, strong 12th house placements. So how do we get that in his life? He's constantly do in relationships and trying to I, I, I find George Clooney very interesting because he's he he's very he's really out there, but there's a there seems to be a depth and he seems to be looking you know mm -hmm. he seems to be yeah seeking and he 
garners these relationships. In the right, right. So Playboy image, right? But also, doesn't he go to Africa every year and campaign for foreign causes, giving his time and energy, which is a loss, to gain something, maybe for others, but also spiritually to gain something. So that's the 12th house. Okay, any questions so far? We're going to erase this. What was it called? Where he, no, never mind. Try not to remember that. Now Arnold is someone with a very powerful first house. First house was what? Self, self and body. body. Yeah, an image, good self-image, right? No lack of uh, self-confidence. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is your sole purpose, S-O-U-L. And according to me, the, this is my definition of sole purpose, this is one definition, is this is something you have come here to learn and do. It's not necessarily something you really want to do, that your personality really like wants, but it's something that that your deeper self has just come and needs to experience. The way we determine this is by finding your sun. Sun is abbreviated as SU, and it indicates your sole purpose. So find in your chart where your sun is. Is it in the first house, second house, third, fourth, fifth, sixth? OK? Everyone? With me? Yeah? The big one, yes, good question. So you have a big chart and you have a little one next to it. Ignore the little one. That's beyond today's topic, okay? That, that has a specific use which we won't get into today. All right. So, for example, I'll give you my example. I have sun here. This is a house of service. Well, when I was growing up, I wanted to be, I don't know, an actor, this, that, the other. I didn't want to be a, a servant. That was like, hell no. But when I look back on my life, as I was looking at my chart, I thought, okay, well, what was my first job? I was a busboy. Then I was a waiter for a year or two. Then I was a, um, a valet. Then I became a personal trainer. And then I became a bartender. Everything I've done has been in the service industry. Sort of against sort of my, my better judgment. I wanted to do other stuff. I wanted to be an academic. I want to be this. I want to be that. I want to travel the world. But what I actually did was this. So whether you like it or not, your sole purpose is indicated by where your son sits. Okay. So if you have son in the 10th house, your soul came to find some level of fulfillment through profession, through the 10th house rules, the classic professions, doctor, architect, uh, lawyer, uh, like a high level engineer. These are the classical sort of professions. You got doctor, lawyer, uh, architect. You know, the things that any Jewish mother wants you to be. Why can't you make Actor. Okay? If you want to marry a doctor, then find somebody who has a son in the 10th house, or a lawyer or an architect. Okay? Now, the thing about people with son in the 10th house is they may not like being that. Or on some level, like they didn't set out to be that, but they became that. Does that make sense? Okay? So. What about son in the first house? You want me to go through the son in all the houses? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so we did six. Son in the first house. Developing, first house is you, yourself, your identity, your body, and being a leader in the world. You may not necessarily have set out to be a leader of others, a manager, um, or even an athlete, but it's your sole purpose is to discover everything about the body, how the sinews work, how your personality is formed, how, 
how you can lead other people, um, health, image, managing your image. Sun in the first house, you are your sole purpose. Right? It means your purpose in life is to integrate everything that you do and study into your own personality. Into Some people say stuff, but they don't do it. You have to do what you say. You have to be the thing that you preach, that you study. If you lead others, you have to lead by example. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it's your, you may, and, and it may not be something that... It's just your sole purpose. Okay? Make sense? Sun in the second house, sole purpose, is connected to one of three things. It's either money. It's either food slash nourishment, right? These are meanings of the second house. All we're doing is combining what we just did, the meanings of each house, with the sun, the meaning of the sun, which is your sole purpose. So your sole purpose will center around nourishment, nourishing yourself and others. Um, and, oh, second house is also speech. It's everything you do with your mouth or face, okay? Second house is your face, particularly the mouth. So people with sun in the second house, their sole purpose could be connected to how they express verbally in the world. It can be connected around food and their relationship with food. Because food, again, in, goes in and out the mouth. Words come in and out the mouth. Also money. Okay? Questions about second house? Would a chef um, occupy the second house with the sun? Could very much. So could a banker. Okay. Oh. Or someone who... Maybe in a reluctant accountant. Maybe the accountant wanted to be a mountain climber, but he was good at accounting, and accountant. <laughs> he was good at accounting, and he sort of f fell into it. Sole purpose. Sole purpose is something that, as you grow older, you sort of look back on your life and you go, "Yeah, I've done that," but okay, so yeah, it, it, it's. It's not something you have to even consciously think about. Oh, maybe I should be a chef. It, it is expressed in your life, generally speaking. Okay? Son in the third house. Two things. One is the arts. Um, like I said before, strong third house placement makes people... I think Sting has son in the third house. Mick Jagger, I think, might have son in the third house. I may be wrong, but... Um, expression. Dancing, singing, um, just art in general. But also sun in the third house indicates courage. Indicates doing things even if when you don't want to, but because you got to do them. And you can push through obstacles. Um, one meaning of the third house is siblings, which we didn't talk about. By the way, guys, all, in the Jyotish books it says, all known and unknown phenomena can be represented by these 12 houses. So if we talk about toenails, they got to fit somewhere. If we talk about uh, nuclear energy, it has to fit somewhere. Means each house has many meanings, but we're going to cover the, the main meanings, okay? When we want to know about, you know, uh, is, does this person have a toe infection or a knee problem? Then, then we'll discuss, you know, maybe is it the 12th house or the 10th or the 9th house because they rule those different anatomies. But generally speaking, we're going to talk about the major significations. So I can't get into all of the meanings of each house. To do that, there are reference books. Hart Defoe and Robert Sabota's excellent seminal book in English on Vedic Astrology is probably the top. It's the one that everybody sort of copies and uses. Uh, but it's also very difficult for people who just want a little bit of understanding but don't necessarily want to become professional astrologers. 
That book is more for people who want to go deep into Jyotish. For people who want more of a, if they're not sure yet. There are other books that are a little more simple and less dense. But uh, these significations, the meanings of all the houses can be found in any book on Jyotish. Okay? Okay, so siblings. So the son in the third house could mean someone who has had to deal with siblings even when they didn't want to. Okay. Okay, fourth house. Son in the fourth house. Fourth house is the mother, and in general, it rules your ancestry. So there is something royal about your ancestry. You come from royal blood. Maybe it's seven generations up. Maybe in a past life you're an Egyptian king or queen. But son in the fourth house rules, says there is some royal ancestry. And your sole purpose is to live out the remaining karma of those ancestors, somehow to please your ancestors. So people with son in the fourth house need to go deep into their subconscious mind and find, you know, we're going to... I'm going to get a little metaphysical here, but find where the karma of their ancestors is still affecting them in a way that you don't want to be affected and deal with that. So it, sun in the fourth house is a house of deep self-inquiry, deep meditation. Deep, 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 deep. Okay? Or it could just mean Real estate, because fourth house is the home also. And home, by extension, means property, land, dealing with land. Mother, by extension, means all of your ancestors. Okay? This is how you build a story for, for yourself and for a client, eventually, when you look at questions on the fourth house. You build a story. So, you know, I could look at, I could be sure that your life revolves around the fourth house, and I'll go, man, real estate is your thing. And you're like, uh, nope, <laughs> it's this one. So part of being a good astrologer is, first of all, being open to divine inspiration because your limited mind can't know everything. Like I said, there's so many meanings to each house. Even if I can identify the house that's the central issue in your life, there's so many things to choose from. So looking at the whole chart, the other planets, which we'll get into in a minute, I can begin to build a story and focus in on, yes, it's, it's actually your ancestors. And maybe your great-grandfather was in World War II, and he, was, uh, he died in a certain way that his soul didn't receive fulfillment. So you need to go into that and and give him completion, either through inner work or through actually going, I don't know, to Japan and, you know? But that, that's where the story takes off. And first you start by building a story for yourself. Sun in the fourth house is difficult to put your finger on. You know, first house, okay, body, personality. Fourth house is very diaphanous, it's nebulous, it's deep. Okay. Son in the fifth. Sole purpose, children. Around having, dealing with, teaching, children. Sole purpose, around creativity. You are born to be creative. Okay? Or being a priest or minister to others, even... If you didn't set out to be, people just ask you for advice. What should I do with this? What should I do with that? Okay? Sixth house, boring. Sixth house, actually, sole purpose. I say it's boring because it's mine. Um, also, sole purpose is around doing the unsexy works. Sixth house is very Ayurvedic. It's about doing your dinacharya. Dinacharya, right? Doing, getting up scraping your tongue, you know, maybe doing busty once a week. All the stuff that you really would rather not do if you had a choice, but that you know is good for you, okay? Sixth house is nutrition, how you eat. 
Second house is food, what you eat. But the sixth house is your nutrition. Nutrition is your habit. Do you eat regularly? Uh, do you buy fast food or do you cook yourself? This is sixth house. So people with strong sixth house placements become good nutritionists, nurses, doctors, right? Okay. Next, seventh house. Relationship. Sun in the seventh house, it's all about the other. Dealing with others, particularly the significant other. Okay? <clears throat> Sun in the eighth house. Your, your sole purpose is uh, connected to depth, deep traditions, finding and dealing with suffering, with, could be sex, dealing um, in some way with sex, death, suffering, or the occult. Okay? Who knows what the word occult means? Occult? Like mystical. mystical? Occult means hidden. When the moon is in an occultation, it is it's hidden. Um, osculare, uh, how, there, I think in Latin languages, do, isn't this used to, mm -hmm. to hide, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Ocultar. Ocultar, okay. Yeah, so the word occult doesn't have occult meanings. It's, it actually does, it has hidden meanings, but it's, it just means hidden, things that are out of sight to the normal world. What we're dealing with when we practice Jyotisha in Ayurveda, we're dealing with the invisible causes of things. So if someone comes to us and says, I have joint problems, I, I get, my mind is wandering, and, and, and I'm getting tremors. We have the hidden cause of that as being a vata dushti, a problem with vata or wind, right? A person who doesn't understand the occult causes, the hidden cause of things, doesn't know. When we study Jyotisha and we see someone's son is in the seventh house, we understand that their sole purpose is centered around relating. But they don't know that because they don't, see, they don't have that occult knowledge. That's why Ayurveda, Jyotisha, you know, um, quantum physics, dealing with invisible things, quarks, right? Quantum physicists, people who deal with the invisible. <clears throat> Eighth house. Okay? Sun in the ninth. Religion. Remember, ninth house. So the sole purpose is centered around religion. Travel. Could be long distance travel. Those of you with sun in the ninth house. So, uh, ninth house is also the father, by the way. God and guru are different versions of the father, we can say, in the sense that they are teachers and mentors. So son in the ninth house, issues with the father, sole purpose connected with the father. Okay? Son in the tenth house, we talked about profession, career, making something of yourself. That's your sole purpose. Making something of yourself, not in a Pollyanna sort of way, get that degree, get that certificate, get that uh, recognition from others. Son in the 10th house. Okay? Son in the 11th house, your sole purpose is to have fun. Oh my God, what a tough place. How hard it must be for y'all with son in the 11th house. Um, son in the 11th house is actually also centered around easy money. Speculation, gambling, stocks. People with sun in the 11th house are interested in creating uh, renewable resources, money, easy money. What I mean by easy money is the kind of money that you don't work 9 to 5 on a wage, on a salary to earn, but that you, maybe you work 9 to 5 or 9 to 9, to nine even, but it's to, to make a particular company make it go public, and then, man, you get a ton of money out of it. You know what I mean? Big gains, big rewards, entrepreneurs, uh, industrialists, 11th house. Easy money. 
and uh, clubs and friends. Okay, maybe the founders of nightclubs or of maybe founders of ashrams, maybe founders of societies. And the twelfth house, sun in the twelfth, sole purpose is connected to the twelfth house, moksha, loss, foreign contacts, foreign dealings. Twelfth uh, house, remember, I'll give you a little, a little trick here, a little advanced trick. The twelfth house is twelve away from the first. Meaning if we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The 12th house to any house is the negation of that house. So, so you can write that down. The 12th house to any house is the negation of that house. So... Here's what that means. I'm get, I like this look. What? Mm -hmm. Shaggy? <laughs> okay. The fourth house. Let's look at the fourth house. Fourth house rules what? Mother. And what? Home. Let's take the meaning of home. Let's count 12 away. Now, when we count in, in Jyotish, we always count inclusively, which means we start with the house itself. So, one. Okay, count with me. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So this house is the twelfth to the fourth. Means it negates the fourth. The fourth house is home. The third house rules moving. Change of residence. Fourth house is the deep unconscious mind. Third house is the superficial mind. The active left, uh, the, co um, the cognizing brain, the judgmental brain. What if you look at the ninth house? What's the twelfth to the ninth? Not you, astrologer woman. Yeah, eighth. <laughs> Good, City Chan. Beautiful. Right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. This is a house of what? Guru. Guru. People with strong eighth house placements tend to be iconoclastic. Uh, Bhagavan Rajneesh, Osho. Do we know Osho? He was a big iconoclast. He gave the middle finger to everybody, both in religious and non-religious circles, in a very spiritual way. The ninth house is also the house of what? Father. Father, guru, travel, also good fortune, luck. People who have ninth house stuff are lucky. People with eighth house stuff, not lucky. Or they have to suffer. They have to earn their way. So the eighth house is bankruptcy. The ninth house is winning the lottery. Bankruptcy, winning the lottery, the negation to that house. This doesn't work all the time for every issue, but typically the 12th to any other house is the negation of that house. Okay? Yes? Great question. So what is the... Um, so the first house is the body. The 12th house is the negation of the body. Hmm? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the question was, what does that have to do with the 12th house and the sole purpose? The sun in the 12th house, the issue is not the body. It's moksha. It's moving beyond yourself. Your sole purpose is to go beyond the borders of this body. For a person with sun in the first house, the sole purpose... Remember, sole purpose is something you don't even necessarily want to do, but you have to establish a personality, an image. Very important. Twelfth house, you have to break your image. And your life will be about breaking the bonds of your image. Sun in the twelfth. Okay? So far, so good? Can I ask a question? Is, 
if you're looking up at the sky, this is also like 10th house's midday sun. Yes. So the time of day also could give you quickly a gauge of what. How yes, and we're going to reinforce all of this in uh, in a little bit. We're going to go into how to use this Jyotish stuff right away in your daily life, like to know when to ask for a raise, you know, when not to ask for a raise. I'll give you a clue. When the sun is in the eighth house, don't ask for a raise. Okay? It's very simple. But you'll know when the sun is in the eighth house because that's what we call the afternoon blah. The mid-morning, uh, I mean, not the mid-morning, the mid-afternoon slump. People start getting edgy. You know, you close your door. I don't want to talk to you right now. Or what do you want? You know, even if you're like bubbly in the morning, by the time the eighth the sun is in the eighth house for these two, hour and a half, two hours, things that just the energy goes shh, dark. So you know, don't bother your boss during this time. Don't call your honey and say, "Hey, baby, how you doing?" He won't like the answer, or she'll hang up on you, or he'll hang up on you. When when do you ask for a raise? Well, we'll talk about that. Okay, sun. Good? Yeah. All right, let's move on. Next. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm not going to go through every house w with all of these, okay? Uh, because we, we have to, you know, get through everything. Next, your major obsession or blind spot is connected to the placement of Rahu. Okay. Now, Rahu and Ketu are always opposite. So if Rahu is here, K2 will always be seven away. To be seven away means you're directly opposite. It's 180 degrees. So if we count from Rahu, counting inclusively, we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and K2 is there. Okay? If Rahu is here in the ninth house, Caitlin, where will K2 be? Um, in the third house. Yes. Good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So K2 will be here. There is always this opposite relationship and so on. Okay? Where Rahu sits is your blind spot. You all know the story of Rahu and K2, who they are, why they exist. Okay. Technically speaking, Rahu is the north node of the moon. And the north node of the moon and the south node, when the sun and moon line up with them, an eclipse is caused. These are the mathematical points in the sky that when the sun and moon cross them, an eclipse is generated. Okay, that's the astronomy. The Vedic tale says that at the beginning of the universe, the gods, the bright beings, the devas, and the dark, the titans, conspired together to create, to churn the universe. Out of the churning of this universe, some great things were formed. One of them was a nectar of immortality, which would render anyone who sipped it immortal. Of course, the titan was like, yeah, 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 we want this. And the gods are, yeah, that would be nice, because they're more polite. Um, but of course, if the titans had got a hold of it, then the universe would just be ripped apart. So Vishnu came out, and he disguised himself as Mohini, the most beautiful female that has ever e existed. And he started dancing. And all the, the titans, you know, they're like these really... They're like biker dudes, you know, they're like really, Arr! they saw her and like, oh, they forgot about the nectar. Of course, they're all male in this, in this story, but I'm sure there were some female 
titanesses, and definitely some female goddesses. But the point is that he distracted the, the, uh, the demons. And while he was distracting them, he said, okay, drink, drink to the gods. And so the gods started drinking. But Rahu, very clever, he said, oh, I'm not falling for this. Disguised himself as a god. So Rahu rules disguise and illusion, Maya. And got in line with the rest of them. And just as the nectar was being passed around, the, uh, the sun and the moon sort of figured it out. They're like, wait a minute, you're not one of us. And they go, Vishnu, <laughs> help. <laughs> because Rahu is very powerful. He's more powerful than the other. Generally, the titans are more powerful. The dark, uh, the, the titans, the demons, what they're sometimes called, are more powerful than the gods. That's why the gods are always calling to Vishnu or to, to the feminine divine or to the masculine divine in some form to save them. Because they're pretty bad at fighting. They're good at giving wealth and gifts and, and honors and the good things in life. But if you want power and status, you know, you worship the titans, like Ravana and the Ramayana. Anyway, so the gods are like, Vishnu, Vishnu, help. Vishnu turns around, throws his discus, and cuts Rahu's head off on the spot. But Rahu had had a, a sip, just as a drop had touched his tongue of the nectar. His head gets cut off. Wow. Disappointment, huh? But he was immortal. So now Rahu becomes a head and a body. So the head is Rahu, Ketu is the tail. And these demons are pictured as having sort of human-like heads and serpent-like bodies. So Ketu is serpent, and Rahu is his big head, like a dragon, you can say. So Ketu swears, I mean Rahu swears revenge against the sun and the moon who tattled on him. And he says, I'm going to get you, suckers. I'm going to get you. And he leaves. So as soon, and he... Uh, he lies in wait, waits for his moment, and when the time is right, he jumps and he swallows the sun. But because he has no body, the sun passes through. And this is what we call an eclipse. This is the myth of the eclipse. Archaeologists say these are myths. What Joseph Campbell taught us is that myths, what we call myths, have deep, powerful, profound truths. And one of the truths of this myth is that Rahu can help you to achieve things you never imagined you can achieve. For example, a demon becoming immortal. No other titan or demon has ever become that. Rahu did it at a great price. The price was he, he, he got chopped in two. So um, people who run Rahu, who are heavily influenced by Rahu, achieve enormous, can achieve enormous things, but they pay a huge price. So Rahu is associated with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It is, for example, Charlie Sheen, Rahu in the first house. Rahu in the first house give a big inflated sense of the self, first house. But it's also your blind spot. You really don't see who you, who you really are. Okay, um, it's not always negative. I'm happy to be thinking of some, well, Britney Spears, big Rahu rise. But with every rise in Rahu, there's a crash. It's a roller coaster. So, you know, there, there was a moment when she faced difficulty, she shaved her head and this, and then it was all weird. Rahu's weird. Weird things happen. It's definitely not nine to five. That's why we say sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and it's a roller coaster. Up and down, up and down. Makes it difficult to predict for astrologers. When you see someone who is in Rahu or heavily influenced, can you predict what Charlie Sheen's going to do tomorrow? I can't. Except that it will be Rahuvian. Okay. Do we know who Charlie Sheen is? Should I not use famous examples? How about what Dr. Bill's going to do tomorrow? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, Dr. Bill doesn't have this. Um, so Rahu has to be somewhere. Everybody has Rahu somewhere. So it's no sin to have Rahu in any house. It just means that where Rahu sits will be your blind spot. It could be your blind spot because you focus so darn much on it. Okay? 
So, and yet you still can't see the truth of it. The antidote to your blind spot will often come from the placement of Ketu, where Ketu is. So in the case of Rahu in the first house, the problem is you, in the sense that your personality, your sense of self. The antidote is having an objective view, having a relationship and someone in a relationship tell you about you. Having a mirror. K2 is that mirror. Okay? So for people with Rahu in the first house, they should focus on working on their relationships. And that will give them a mirror to themselves. Okay? Rahu in the second house. Speech. People may blurt out things. They may not speak appropriately. They may speak too much or too little, okay? Or have weird relationship with money. Rahu in the second house. The antidote is where Ketu sits. Okay? Going deep into occult, in the occult, maybe learning an oral tradition, um, dealing with death, understanding your sexuality, stuff like that. Okay, Rahu in the third house. Do you guys want me to go through all of these for Rahu? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's why we're here. Okay. So much for the meditation thing. Okay. I'll just tell you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll guide you, but you, you still have to sort of meditate on it and say, okay, I have Rahu in the second house, so how has this played out in my life? How can I apply this eighth house antidote? Okay, Rahu in the third Periods of great courage and gusto and periods of great timidity, ups and downs. Let's go climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And then you do it. And then the next, you know, the next day you see a cockroach go, ah, someone please get that. <laughs> you know, Rahu, because Rahu also rules insects. Snakes, roaches, so on. So Rahu in the third, tremendous creativity. Could be an amazing dancer, an amazing musician. Especially Rahu and Venus together. Boy, now we have someone who's an amazing actor, an amazing, because Venus is the arts, music. We all know Venus, right? Beauty. Rahu tends to expand things, but like expanded like with LSD. Like it's like, whoa blow things out of proportion. Jupiter also expands, but he's sattvic. He expands sweetly. Rahu expands like a nuclear bomb. And then there's fallout. So Rahu, Venus together could mean people who uh, deal with the entertainment industry or um, music, dance, stuff like that. Okay? But that's Rahu in the third house. Antidote, of course, is what? Which house? The ninth. the ninth. Learning a little bit about religion, spirituality. Finding a guru. Talking to your dad. Maybe traveling overseas somewhere to see how different people do things. Make sense? Does is this making sense? I mean, to the, you guys, yeah? Okay. Okay. Because I feel like I'm just talking. Okay. All right, Rahu in the fourth. Ooh, problems with the mother. Either a very attached relationship to the mother, or like you just left home early. Or problems with property or in your ancestors. Okay. Uh, Dissatisfaction with the home life. Remember, Rahu is not satisfied with his status quo. He wants to be mortal. He doesn't like being mortal. Of course, after he had his head chopped off, he's very dissatisfied. OK, I'm immortal, but now I'm chopped in two. So Rahu will achieve, and as soon as he or she gets that achievement, eh, next, eh, and he wants to eat everything, right? 
So people, I'm exaggerating, but people who are heavily influenced by Rahu, say you're in a Rahu period, you will never be happy with what you have. And in that, if you're happy with the fact that you're never going to be happy while you're in Rahu, you can find a sense of equilibrium. Because you go, okay, Rahu is, five, is going to last for so many years, or so many months. Just know that for those months, you will have a lingering sense of dissatisfaction. Like, you'll get what you want often, but that'll leave 10 other things that you didn't get that you also want. Okay? Make sense? That an actor gets a movie part, but they don't get nominated for best picture. Or they make a bunch of money, but, I don't know, they have to spend it on something. Rahu in the fourth house, dissatisfied with the home life. Antidote, career. Become somebody. By the way, in your pretty little notes, um, handouts, actually, why don't you take out the uh, second handout, the one that does not have Ganesh on it, and flip it to the back. Yeah, that one. Can I show? This one? Flip it to the back. These are notes, shorthand notes, on Rahu in the houses. Very fascinating. This was written by an amazing astrologer called Hank Friedman, who uh, writes on the web. Here's a little plug for Hank Friedman. I don't know him personally, but I've read his articles. That is from him. It, um, he does lessons online that are free. And he's, he's published a lot of stuff that you can just access online. I believe his site is called soulhealing.com. And he has wonderful articles. For those of you who want to go on with Jyotish and learn more, his teacher is the same as my teacher, hard to follow. OK? So you can learn more about Rahu and Ketu in the houses by reading that. Just want you to know you have that resource there. OK, Rahu in the fifth. Problems with creativity or children, or maybe not problems, but they can be a blind spot. Overattachment in times of missing them so much, they're gone, and then you're together and you're. Rahu is the, those extremes. Rahu in the fifth. Blind spot could also be creativity, like I said. Fifth house is the house of higher intellect. It can impair judgment in the sense of, OK, you make some bad decisions. But if you understand that, OK, big deal. I got Rahu in the fifth. And ultimately, life is not about, oops, you got it wrong, done. You get to try over and over again. Rahu can also make you actually deeply perceptive. Remember, Rahu is the only one who realized, hey, that's not some Dakini dancing, that's Vishnu. He's trying to distract us. He had very deep insight. But he used the insight not for the best, <laughs> right? Instead of saying, hmm, what does that mean? Maybe I should stop being so demonic. He said, no, I want to be more demonic. In fact, I want to be immortal as a demon. <laughs> so poor judgment. And some people say, well, why was Vishnu so cruel? Why did he cut his head off? Why, you know, the guy tried so hard. Ultimately, Vishnu was being compassionate. Because can you imagine being trapped in this life and in this universe forever as a, like a biker dude? Or as a, not, not even a biker dude, but as someone with very sort of tamasic, dark thoughts, always thinking the same dark revenge, jealousy, desire, greed, and always having those throughout all eternity. And watching your fellow people eventually die and get some peace, and you're never at peace. So Vishnu said, I'm going to spare you from that fate. So ultimately, it was a compassionate act to just cut Rahu in half. But Rahu doesn't see it that way. <laughs> He's like, give me I want what I want. Okay. So the antidote, society, friends, uh, social contacts are somehow the antidote to Rahu in the fifth house. Mind you, these aren't 
always set in stone. But often you can look to where Ketu sits to find the antidote to your Rahu. Okay, questions? Rahu in the sixth. Okay, service, enemies. What else does the sixth house indicate? Work and duty. People who are overly attached to work and duty, like working 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week. Martyrs who will martyr themselves to, to a cause. Also, because it's a blind spot, you may make, you may rub people the wrong way sometimes. You may make, especially at work, or you may make enemies without knowing it. Not like mortal enemies who want to do you in, but sometimes you may do things and say things that rub people the wrong way, and you're not aware of it. Because Rahu is a blind spot, it rules being unaware. Okay? It could be overly attached to service, needing to be of service. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Great healers, uh, uh, social workers come out of this powerful need. Okay. Rahu in the seventh. Oh, so the antidote. Good, good question. The antidote is which house? Twelve. How can we see that to being an antidote? Spiritual growth. Spiritual growth, yeah. Twelfth house is a house of loss. It means putting down your day planner, turning off your clock, losing all sense of time, place. Now, what will often happen with people who are overworkers and uh, like type A, whatever, they'll turn to a sip of whiskey. <sighs> a drag of weed, whatever it is, just to lose that sense of, man, I got to do this, 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 this tomorrow. Escape, not necessarily a bad thing, depending on, on do you escape on your own terms or does, does this escape sort of grab you? You know, at a certain point when you drink for the non-alcoholic, you are having a drink. For the alcoholic, the cup says, get over here. Pour this thing, now drink it. Good. Now have another. It controls you. You have no free will. You think you do. Your free will is limited to the type of scotch you buy, you know, for a real alcoholic. So do you control the escape or does the escape control you? Twelfth house is escape. The escape could mean going to Mexico for two weeks and lying on the beach. Remember, this is foreign contact. Foreign escapes. Great title for a travel agency. Um, I, I want 10%. If you guys do. <laughs> so, antidote, 12th house. Okay? What about Rahu in the seventh? Trouble with relationships. Mm, relating with others. Or in a. a a domineering and an, or a somehow Rahuvian. This person is attracted to Rahu type of people. Whether you're a man or a woman, the seventh house indicates your partner. If you have Rahu in the seventh, means your partner is somehow different, an outsider, a rebel, or either very domineering or somehow just unpredictable. Unpredictable. Okay? Again, not bad or good, it just is. This is your karma. Where K2 sits, now here's one thing about K2. K2 often creates a void wh where it sits. It means a lack in that area. Why? Well, because Rahu is the one who's taken up all the attention. So people who have Rahu in the seventh house have K2 where? First, right? People with K2 in the first house means there is a void in the area of what? Self-identity. People with K2 in the first house for a long time don't know who they are, why they're here. They have a, a smoke. K2 is represented by smoke sometimes. They have a very loose idea of what their 
it's mysterious of who they are. Joseph Campbell, K2 in the first house. In his journals when he was a young man, he would write, I'm so frustrated that I still haven't figured out that, that I haven't accomplished anything in life. And yet when I think about all the things that I could be doing, I don't want to do any of those. <laughs> so there's a sense of like there's mystery. You're open to mystery, but you still don't know who you are yet until later in life. Of course, he became someone, you guys know Joseph Campbell? He sort of founded a system of, within the structure of academics, uh, the, he brought myth, he made myth cool. Nobody before then was really talking about myth until he did it. Janis Joplin, K2 in the first house. Strong sense of, you know, she was a pimply, overweight teenager, just, and found escape through music, but she didn't, she hated herself. And it, at extremes, K2 will create such a void in the area that, you know, she of course ended up dying very prematurely because of a lack of sense of self, a lack of self-esteem, which she, maybe she had overbearing partners or partners who used her or whatever, and she didn't have enough self-worth, you know? So people with K2 in the first house, you have to be very careful. They will either become mystics, reformers of a system, they'll create some, something totally new, even within the structure of their, um, of their field, or they can become self-destructive. Okay, questions? Is this helpful? Yeah. Okay, Rahu in the eighth, oh boy. Pimps and tax collectors. <laughs> I'm not judging who's better and who's worse. <laughs> okay, so what could Rahu in the eighth mean? Don't read the note. <laughs> okay, she said money and security issues. Where that actually comes from is K2 being where? Second. In the second. K2 is the void. So it creates a void in the area of money and sustenance. But that's your actual antidote to the problem. But let's talk about what the problem is first. Let's identify the problem. So Rahu in the eighth is what? I'll tell you, this is one of the most difficult placements because Rahu, we can easily say, is the most malefic planet, even more than Saturn, be, because he'll make you judge wrongly. And for that, you often pay through regret, through, you know, you pay for the rest of your life. But Rahu, as a malefic, in the most malefic house, even if you never see a Rahu period, can create just a sense of suffering, a sense of obstacles. But what is, what is the blind spot here? Talk to me. What does the eighth house mean? Death. Death. Okay. So maybe people with Rahu in the eighth house are oblivious to their own mortality. They'll do stuff, so they'll do drugs. They'll do whatever. They'll ride their motorcycle like at 120 miles an hour, oblivious to their own mortality, and pay the price. Now, that price could be death, but if there are also maybe good planets influencing, we'll, we'll get more into that later, then maybe the price is the cost, the, the, the quantum of the cost is determined by integrating other factors, but there is definitely a cost. What else, else is a eighth house rule? Sex. Sex. <sighs> sexual diseases, um, sexual excess, sexual frustrations, all those things. Perhaps an aversion to the occult. Or, or, a, or a deep attachment, a powerful sense of iconoclasm maybe. Mm -hmm. Someone who is Maybe this is the biker, dude or dudette, you know, um, especially if they run this period. But 
the eighth house is the house of the outsiders. So Rahu and but sex and death. Just we can even just stay there. This is where the the blind spot is. Money, sustenance. Learn to nourish yourself. Learn to create a support system. Second house is also family. Connect with your family. Okay. Let's move on. Ninth house, Rahu. Blind spot is. Let's go. Joyce? It's okay. Spirituality. Okay, what else? Spirituality? Travel? What else? Guru. Okay, so let's talk about that. Rahu, how is spirituality a blind, blind spot? Overzealous. Evangelical, good. Or... The, the opposite, shopping, right? Extremes, up and down. Okay, travel. Remember... Wow, do you speak from experience? I don't... <laughs> I don't know. You don't have that. Okay, good, good, okay. Well, it's okay. Yes, we all have Rahu somewhere. But here's the beautiful thing. We all have this somewhere. We all have Saturn somewhere. We all have Rahu. Dad, also father. Maybe an up and down extreme relationship with dad. Okay? Antidote? Third house. Okay? How can the third house be an antidote? Maybe the arts. Yeah. Grow a pair. I don't know what that means. Um, courage? No, but also siblings, working with siblings. Maybe investigating. Um, doing research, reading. Remember, this is the active mind. Board games. I don't know. You know, for some people, board games, doing the crossword puzzle is just, it's their meditation. And that, that could be like their antidote. And you as an astrologer or as a counselor, if you actually pick up on that and you go, you really need your time to do your Sudoku every day. Man, and... You know, I've done this, and, with, and it's such a simple thing, and the client just melts, and they go, oh, man, really? Is it okay? Because I feel like, like I'm wasting time. But no, it's their meditation. So third house. By the way, people with Rahu in the third house, horrible handwriting. I don't have it there, but Rahu in the third house, very weird handwriting. Third house is writing. You can actually tell a lot about a person's handwriting by the planet they have in the third house. So if you have Jupiter, you may write big or elegant. If you have Venus, definitely pretty. I encourage you to research that. Actually, Dr. Law talks about that. I haven't researched that, so maybe you guys can give me some feedback about your third houses. Moon in the third, maybe emotional writing, imaginative. Okay, Rahu in the tenth, blind spot. Career. Huh? Career. Career, profession. Okay. Antidote, develop a home life. Call your mom. Okay. Rahu in the 11th. This is actually not such a bad place for Rahu. Because this is the house of fun. Rahu likes to have fun. Um, how, how can that be a blind spot? Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe constant party, yeah, the Paris Hilton thing. So what's the antidote? Gambling, good, Rahu in the 11th. The extreme desire for easy gains, easy money, perhaps. K2 in the 5th, so the antidote is, yeah, having kids, have kids. That'll cure you about everything. <laughs> Don't spend $5 million going to therapists. To well, <laughs> baby needs a new pair of shoes. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, children, but also discrimination. Fifth house is the house of buddhi. Develop good discrimination. Become a counselor to others. And Rahu in the 12th. 
could be extreme escapism. You are constantly in the akash, in the ether. So no sense of time or structure. You get up at 2, go to bed at whatever. So Rahu in the 12th. Could mean other things. Strong desire for foreign, foreign contact, foreign business. Okay, foreign knowledge. What is the antidote? <laughs> Service. Duty. Daily routine. Dinacharya. Okay? Good. Any questions on Rahu and Ketu? All right. Again, enter this through your own chart. Really understand the placement of your own. Then you'll be able to tell people about theirs. Okay? All right. Next. Oh, you guys need a break? No, we're good? Still rock on? Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to give you a big lunch. Okay. The next, so these are the three biggies. After them, we can talk, who do you want to talk about? Saturn, Venus, Moon? Saturn. Saturn? Saturn? <laughs> My kind of people. Saturn. You may be surprised why Saturn's not one of the biggies, but. Okay. Where Saturn sits will show you where you have hurdles. Obstacle, where things are slow to develop. Things develop slowly. Saturn delays, but never denies. Saturn delays, but never denies. Okay, so let's take a look. So what if you have Saturn in the first house? What could that mean? It takes you a long time, to forget who you are. It takes you a long time, yeah. Slow to develop in personality. Remember, Shani is the farthest plan visible planet from Earth. You can see Shani with your naked eye. The other planets, Neptune, Uranus, Pluto, which technically isn't a planet anymore, but still used very, very effectively in Western astrology, you can't see them, you need a telescope. So in Jyotish, we deal with what is visible to the naked eye. But Shani is very far away and very cold. Hmm? Shani is very cold, slow, the slowest moving of the visible planets. And so, Attaching cold, and it's dark, because the sun barely reaches there. And so, what does that tell us about this person's person? <laughs> a little bit maybe introverted, or not like Tony Robbins, like, hey everyone, all right, we're glad to be here now. <laughs> now I got your attention, right? That's not Saturn. Saturn is more the math professor, you know. But. Saturn people mature later in life. And when Saturn does mature, so when people reach 40 and up, they finally learn who they are, Saturn in the first house. They get a sense of dignity from having worked and developed their personality for so long. There's a sense of dignity. Some people mature at 16 and they're, all right, I know who I am. I'm blah, blah, blah. Saturn, not so much. Okay? Questions? Saturn in a second. I'm so tempted. I want to ask, who has Saturn here? Who, who is? Who is this? Okay. What about Saturn in a second? Slow to connect with family. And mm -hmm. food and make money. Nutrition, money. And make money. Money comes slowly. So, um, obstacle in money, money obstacles, money problems. Okay. Very simple. Just attach the word problem to the meaning of the house, and then you get the meaning of Saturn in the house. Image problem, body problem, 
joint you know, body, so Saturn rules. Saturn is a vata planet, by the way. Rules vata in the body. So gas, joint problems, whatever. Vata in your bank account <laughs> means you open the vault and maybe one little dollar bill floating around trying to catch it. That's Saturn in the second. Saturn in the third. What's Saturn in the third? Maybe not a good dancer. <laughs> Problems with the spontaneous or so, you know the expressive creative those arts like dance, music, um, writing. Perhaps a person wants to be a dancer, but it just doesn't come naturally. But because they have salmon, they they work hard at. Yes, and in the school play, they play the part of the rock, and they're. <laughs> So for two hours, they're doing this, and they feel really, really good. I, I'm an actor. <laughs> but they're a Saturnian actor. So you're right. They, Boris Karloff maybe has Saturn in the third house. I will suck your blood. Saturn in the third. Not Tom Cruise, but, right? Does it mean you're, you're bad at it, or you're slow to develop? Slow to develop means, um, problems with siblings or slow to appreciate your siblings, slow to... See, Saturn in the third is actually not a bad place. Definitely better than it being in the first. Saturn in the third gives problems with courage in the sense of, I'm going to go out and get that job. I'm going to go, go out and, I don't know, let's go play football in the rain. Saturn person in the third would be like, well, maybe we should wear a coat and, you know, <laughs> a, little, a little bit more cautious. Again, these are generalizations, but <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? Oh, this towel? Oh, lose the towel. Okay, well, I'm, okay, thank you. <laughs> My image consultant says lose the towel. Is that better? Okay, oh, because I'm waving it around. Okay. Sa <laughs> now notice, unlike Rahu Ketu, there is no antidote per se. Rahu needs an antidote. Saturn, the antidote is, the thing is not denied, it's just delayed. So the thing itself will come, the thing that you lack. Okay? So quickly now, Saturn in the fourth. Problem with? Mom. Mom. Problem. Now, remember we talked about Sun in the fourth house, you have a royal lineage, you have Somewhere in your ancestral DNA, there is, there were kings or queens or, or commanders, royal people. With Saturn in the fourth, somewhere in your DNA, there was a lot of service. Saturn rules servants. It rules menial class people. And somehow you're living out the legacy either by becoming, you know, Marilyn Monroe has a very powerful Saturn in this very place. What we know about her is that she was basically an orphan. She had a terrible relationship with her mom, you know, and her parents. Um, didn't, you know, didn't know who she was. And in effect, even though she became a queen of the silver screen, and, and there's a sense of karma. Hi, welcome. <laughs> John. John of two charts. Um, that she was still a servant to the... Uh, the producers, the directors, the, the machine, the Hollywood machine. She tried so hard to break out of it. She was second class to the Kennedys and the president, you know. She was, she, even though she was first class to all of the fans, she sort of lived as a servant, you know, in, in that way. So she lived out a certain maybe legacy of Saturn in the fourth house. Very difficult. Fourth house is Sukkha. Write this down. Su, k. Su in Sanskrit means good. K means space. The fourth is the house of su, k. Good space. Good space here in the heart. Fourth house rules the chest and the heart. So the fourth house rules happiness, contentment, being just 
content and happy with who you are. People with Jupiter here, or a nice Venus or a moon, a good, nice, sweet planet, are just happy people on a deep level. They're just content. Bad things may happen to them, but they're OK. People with Saturn here, unlike Rahu, who is like very n nervy and unsatisfied, Saturn is gloomy. Saturn in the fourth house makes the person just inherently a little bit depressed, or it can make the person a little depressed, because it's creating a vo uh, darkness, coldness, and vata in the heart. In Ayurveda, you can diagnose maybe heart or lung problems with Saturn in the fourth. OK? Make sense? Saturn in the fifth. Delay in having kids. Remember, delay but never deny. Um, delay in getting your creativity on, again, like Saturn in the third. A serious mind. The fifth house is the buddhi, the mind. A serious mind. A scientist. I want proof. An intellectual. Not writing poetry. A serious mind. Saturn in the fifth. Saturn in the sixth. Let's do this. Let's not go through Saturn and all of them. You guys can fill in problems with, OK? Ju -ju -ju. Boy, Saturn in the seventh, though. Let, let, let me just do that one, and we'll stop. What does Saturn in the seventh mean? Relationships. Saturn rules old age. Therefore, whatever house he sits in, he will make it look old. So Saturn in the seventh gives you an older partner, or a partner who may appear older. Saturn in the fifth, maybe your kids are maybe older or more mature than you. You know, some people go out with their kids, and you can't tell that they're, like, they're, doesn't mean they have Saturn in the fifth, but um, Saturn in the first, you look old. You have a beard. You know, you have a white beard. People, Saturn people like to grow. <laughs> Saturn. But he's too jolly. You know, yeah, anyway, let's not go into it. So Saturn rules old age. So wherever Saturn sits, there will be. So Saturn, <laughs> I said I wouldn't go through them, but examples are coming. Saturn in the ninth of religion, the person espouses an established religion. I'm Catholic. Oh, I won't look at anything else. Or oh, I'm Hindu. No, no, no. Everything else is, no, no. Saturn. A certain sense of conservatism, oldness in the area. Saturn in the 10th, conservative in terms of prof uh, profession. Saturn in the 10th also makes a person a dictator. Dictator. You listen to me or else. No, that's how it is. Iron fist, Saturn in the 10th. Saturn in the 10th, Napoleon, you got your, well, I don't want to name, because you, people with Saturn in the 10th will get down on yourselves. But a lot of very successful people, from one standpoint, because well, it's, it gives a, a dictatorial frame of mind. Even if you're not, even if you're very sweet, Inside, you, you have an iron fist, and you know it. Yes? I don't want to get but um, is that because there's a lack of profession you feel like you just need to tell everybody what to do, even though you don't? The question is, is, does that arise out of the sense of because there's a lack of profession? Well, Saturn doesn't mean lack. Saturn means overcoming obstacles, uh, things that are slow to develop. Lack is K2. K2 in the 10th house can be I don't have a job. I don't even know what a job is. Or I work at a weird job. Saturn in the 10th actually means a traditional job, working your way up the corporate ladder. You start as a clerk. In 25 years, you become the CEO. But because you become the CEO and you've worked you damn hard for it, you're going to boss people around. No mercy, because you've earned it. Dictator. Right? OK. <laughs> Done with Saturn. Saturn in the 11th? 
Okay, what about it? Tell me. No, that's the 12th. So Sat question was, what about Saturn in the 11th house? 11th is what? Oh, you meant 12th house. Okay, well, let's finish it, finish it up then since we're here. Saturn in the 11th. Friends and companions, maybe society, older, or maybe, uh, maybe there's coldness there, so difficulty in making friends. Saturn in the 11th, I have a picture of an industrialist. Someone who, whose friends are mainly through money and through society, but not like deep, uh, you know, on a very profound level. Saturn in the 11th um, delays inheritances. Saturn in the 11th, because remember, it's easy money, so he will delay you getting that easy money, but you will get it. Um, Saturn in the 11th can delay enjoyments. So maybe putting your money in a 10-year sort of CD or yield or stock that you don't see until later. Saturn is all of, you know, Saturn people rule. Saturn people often, you know, have sex without climaxing, especially in the men. Maybe they're the ones who learn to delay enjoyment for a future gain. That's Saturn, especially sort of in this area. Make sense? Saturn 11th? Not yet? No? Obstacles, problems with, but also when you do get it, you got it. Could you go over Saturn in the 9th again? Saturn in the 9th. We get a traditionalist in terms of a very spiritual person, but a traditional person. Born in a Hindu family, I'm a Hindu. That's it. Oh, no, that's good for those people, but I'm a Hindu. Oh, I'm a Catholic. Um, maybe a cold relationship with the father. Saturn in the ninth. Uh, because the ninth is a house of good luck, so obstacles to luck. So again, someone who has to work hard to make their luck. But again, Saturn delays, but doesn't deny. Not. Okay? And Saturn in the twelfth, this person will never stop traveling. Whoever has Saturn in the twelfth, can you affirm that with a silent nod or deny it? <laughs> they will never stop traveling because they love foreign places. And see, Saturn in and of itself, because it's so far from the Earth, it's the farthest planet, visible planet, it rules going far away. So let me go back to Saturn in the seventh. You marry a foreigner, especially if Rahu is there too, boy. But Saturn is someone from a faraway place. A foreigner or an older person. Uh, but Saturn who rules faraway places and is dark in the house of foreign contacts. means you're just traveling all the time. It's not a bad place. It's a good place for Saturn. Can also indicate a desire for moksha. A desire for spiritual liberation. TK? Still good on break, or do we need a break? Good? OK. Next, who do we want to talk about next? Moon. The luscious moon. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. We just talked about malefics, correct? Yeah. We're going to keep talking. We're going to talk about every planet. The reason we talk about the bad ones first is so we know what to do with them. So in case you guys fall asleep in 15 minutes, at least you got the, the, the malefics. <coughs> yeah. No, we haven't forgotten. Malefics are, the bad malefics are the ones who make you experience that portion of your karma that you don't necessarily want to experience. <laughs> the delays, the obstacles. I just want to be rich, famous, healthy, happy, and successful now. Saturn says, well, work for it. OK, moon equals your special talent, which you're good at. What are you good at? Moon is emotions, is emotional mind. 
it, it's what makes you like something. When you like something, you tend to start doing it. And when you do it, you get good at it. So a moon can be a special, something that's special in your life. Just the emphasis is on the word special. So where the moon sits is what's special for you. Okay? So, who has moon in the first house? Okay? You're special. You're special. Okay? Has a, has a flair for personality. They have a, their special talent is their themselves, their personality. Krishna has the moon in the first house. And Krishna means what? What is the word Krish? 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 Attractive. People with moon in the first house are attractive. Like if you look up at the sky and there's a full moon, are you going to look at the star on the sun? Now you're going to see that you can't help but notice the full moon, right? You can't help but notice a person with a moon in the first house, okay? There's something attractive about them. They may not even be classically handsome or beautiful, but they're attractive. They're like, you want to, you want to hug them like a little teddy bear. So Krishna, so their personality. Moon in the first. Do you have, really have moon first? Huh? I, think, I have a different chart. So. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, moon in the second house. What's special? Family. Family. Maybe you have a special, a deep bond with your family, a special relationship with your family, or a sense of family that's, that just warms your heart, like you, you love food. Here is where you make a good chef or a good singer. I think Pavarotti has moon in the second house. What about money? Special talent with money, yeah. So either a special talent for food, you know, any of those second house meanings, but good cooks, moon in the second house. Okay, moon in the third, what's a special talent? Arts, singing, dancing, uh, creativity, performing. Also, maybe one of their siblings is somehow special, or they have a sister who is special. Okay? Well, we're taking the case, the question was special how? If the moon is very bright and full, we can say that that, uh, then that sister or sibling is, is somehow talented or stands out. Of course, if you're moon, if you're born during a new moon, it won't be so emphasized. So we, we have to know how full the moon is. But in general, we're still at the general level. There's something special about your handwriting, third house. Okay? Okay, moon in the. <laughs> your home is your hearth, your a special, cozy environment. You have a talent for uh, maybe real estate, you have a, you definitely need to be around water. You have moon in the fourth. Yeah. The moon brings light into your deeper mind. This is a very good place for the moon to be. This makes you emotionally mature. If you know people with moon in the fourth, or if you yourself have it, congratulations. Emotional maturity, yeah, really. Um, and that comes from, remember fourth house is sukkah, good space. You just, you have a good space inside. So nothing can really shake you that much. You don't get um, flustered by life's little, little things. Everything's okay. But you definitely need to live around water. Moon in the fourth, moon is water, fourth house can rule water. Okay? Those of you with moon in the fourth, can you confirm or deny? Do you love water? Yes. Yes? Yes? Okay, good. Thank you. We have two <laughs> volunteers. Okay, moon in the fifth. What's special? Children. Children. Or you just, you're a poet. And? Romance. Romance. You're a romantic. Yes, all of that. Moon in the fifth makes you a poet, a romantic, uh, um, just creative, a lover, a lover of play, of, of, of the higher sentiments. Um, moon in the fifth. 
your mind is very creative. Very creative. Okay? Moon in the sixth. Special talent for? For service. Yeah, good. For working hard. Brushing your teeth. Maybe you become a dentist. Moon. Uh, moon in the sixth house. Because the moon rules our calendars, the moon rules the daily rhythms, and the sixth house is Dinacharya, a special knack for timing things, for, for rith being in rhythm with nature, usually comes out of times when you are not in rhythm with nature and you've paid the price. Okay? Moon in the seventh. Relationships, marriage. Yeah. Special. Something special about your ability to relate to others. Remember, the seventh house is the other, so relating to others. Specifically, the partner or the spouse. The spouse may be very special. Okay? A relationship counselor, a... Um, Someone who knows about relationships. <coughs> Moon in the eighth. Moon in the eighth is a tough but rewarding place. Moon is very delicate. It doesn't like the dark jungle of the eighth house. Eighth is a cave. Anything that goes in there disappears. So moon in the eighth can give you dark thoughts. You think... Maybe, you know, you think things that other people don't think. <laughs> Moon in the eighth house. Maybe a dark creativity, but out of that can come some great stuff. Or you have a special talent for taxes, for sex, for death, for understanding death, transcending death, for classical traditions like Jyotish, Ayurveda, uh, Kung Fu, um, Anything that's classic oral tradition that you can't read from a book and get it. Okay? Questions? Moon in the ninth, special guru. Your guru may be a, fem a woman or your deity may be a woman. Okay? A love of overseas travel. Flying over the ocean to get somewhere, to go to Italy. Moon is water, ninth house is travel. Put it together. Okay, moon in the 10th house, special talent for being conspicuous, for being seen. Moon in the 10th house people can become famous w w whether they try or not. They just become seen. Okay. My special talent and my um, will to develop are in the 10th house. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, how does, how does that played out in your life? Oh, her question was, my, or her, her statement was, my special talent and my slow to develop, Saturn, are both in the same house. Later we'll talk about combinations of two planets together, because this is where it gets interesting. So is it okay if we talk about it? Absolutely. She has Saturn, Moon in the same house. What this will give is Saturn is reserve, Moon is emotions. So Saturn, moon people can be seen maybe as being cold emotionally, even though they're not, but they may be perceived that way. Saturn moon gives a hold on your emotions. Like even the way you're sitting now, you're like this. <laughs> no, but e everything, is, everything is a signal, you know, everything, there's a reserve there. Um, Saturn is blackness, the moon is thinking. Saturn moon people often dress in black to sort of match their, um, they can be pessimists. They, they can definitely see the cup being half empty, even if they're not, now other things would need to be there to make it really bad, but they tend to think what could go wrong rather than what's gonna go right, okay? That's Saturn Moon together. Saturn Moon together also reluctant to enter into any kind of contractual relationships, so they can often be or experience, not often, sometimes they'll experience like the runaway bride syndrome, where <laughs> they're like, okay, we're getting married, and either they or their partner runs away at the last minute. 
that can happen sometimes, that, not always. Make sense? Now, when we put these two then into a house, this is why I want you to start tempering with your own meditation. So what does this mean? I have a special talent and yet it doesn't mature until later in life or it's slow to develop or maybe I'm too hard on myself and don't let it flower. Because Saturn can overwhelm the moon. It's so dark and cold. Remember in Ayurveda, 70% of disease is called by, caused by vata. So vata can vitiate the, the, the gentle little moon. Okay, but this is, so what house is your? It's in the professional. Okay, Saturn moon in the tent. So it means you're a dictator and you're really good at it. <laughs> you have a special talent for it. Done. Next. Saturn. So Saturn moon. This is uh, often, Saturn moon, especially if you have Venus somewhere here, could, could um, the mm, entertainment industry. Um, Saturn moon and you have Mars here could be sports, the uh, sports industry. It depends on where the other planets are. But by themselves, Saturn moon can definitely make you an efficient iron fist in a velvet glove. <laughs> also. Okay? Is it if your moon and your sun are in the same? Because the sun is, is, is that good if they're in the same house? Is it good if the moon and the sun are in the same place? Okay, well, I don't want to get into all the combinations, but I'll tell you one thing. If you have sun and moon together, uh -huh. that means you're born on a new moon. Because, I'm going to put the towel down. <laughs> if this is the sun, and... Um, and this is the moon. When the moon comes here, it's invisible. If you're looking at the sun, you can't see it. As the moon comes opposite, oh, Earth is in the middle. Okay, so Earth is here. As the moon comes here, it becomes full. So whenever the moon is in the opposite house from the sun, it is full. Opposite means seven away. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. When it's in the same house, it's a new moon. New moon people like Saturn in moon because the moon is black, Kali. They tend to worship or be as, they're associated with the goddess Kali because Kali is the dark one. It's a dark moon. Or Lilith in, uh, in Christian uh, mythology. The dark moon, again, thinks dark thoughts. But not dark thoughts just for the sake of thinking dark thoughts, but because they... I wonder what causes bad things to happen. Like, there's a, there's a sense of wanting to know the underbelly of things. So Sun, Moon is a, can be a lot like Sun, Saturn together. But the Sun and the Moon are friends, so it works a little bit better than the Sun, Saturn being together. But it, that's Kali. Are you familiar with the, that's Kali energy. There, Sun, Moon together. Okay? Okay, Moon in the 11th. Special friends. Moon in the 12th. Moon in the 12th, um, a special love and ability to, to escape. So be careful with addictions and, uh, you know, escapist tendencies there. Especially if like Rahu and Saturn and, other, and Mars are there. Okay? Yes? If, what was, uh, I, I missed it, I'm sorry. Uh, moon in, in the second house. Moon in the second house. A talent for voice. Uh, or a good cook, because the second house is anything that comes in or out of your mouth. So food, a talent with food, or a talent with money. Second house is sustenance. Um, speech, singing or speaking. Lord Byron had moon in the second house, and he was an excellent poet. Now the second house rules poetry, unlike the fifth, which rules poetry, the second house rules spoken poetry, so oral tradition. So someone, for example, someone who has a powerful eighth house may study Sanskrit and become a scholar, but if they don't have a good second house, they can't pronounce it. Vice versa, if they have a good second house, they may study a, a tradition and be able to pronounce it really well,
but may not be able to go very deep if their eighth house isn't good. Does that make sense? So people with a strong eighth house are very good researchers, going deep into a subject. But if the second house is not there, they may not be able to express it. So second house is that oral expression. Singers, uh, so poets in the traditional sense of a bard, a banker, or a cook. I have a question. The blind spot. Yes. He lives with uh, 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 another uh, planet. Does that make the planets uh, weaker? Or the question is, if Rahu, which rules your blind spot, is together with another planet, what happens? Well, what happens is, first of all, that blind spot is emphasized somehow. Now Rahu is emphasized, but Rahu will take on the quality of that planet. So remember I told you guys about Rahu Venus together? Rahu will blow things out of proportion. Say it's Rahu and, and Moon. Now, okay. I'm going to talk about planet combinations okay. together a little bit later. I'll give you a quick preview. Rahu and Moon together make people psychic. They make people, their astral field is permeable, so their ghosts can come in. Other entities can disturb that person's, their, their ojas is compromised, their immunity, also their sort of um, psychic immunity is compromised. Now, that can be good, and they get you know, visions, they can predict things, but it can be bad when bad things come. So they need to learn how to keep a healthy barrier, Rahu Moon together. Almost invariably, you see Rahu Moon together, deep insight, psychic, but also vulnerable. <laughs>